hey guys, in this video the lovely team is going to be talking to you about local and devolved government for your GCSE citizenship. Now there are lots of different facts you need to be able to remember in this that you're going to need to recall for your exam. So to help you with that, over on my website there are loads of questions just waiting for you. several different types of local government. County councils usually have authority over more rural areas. Examples include North Yorkshire County Council and Cornwall Council. In both these examples, these county councils have authority over huge but sparsely populated areas where the primary industry is agriculture and most people live in villages, hamlets or small towns. Metropolitan district councils or city councils usually have authority over smaller urban areas and their local environs. Examples include Leeds City Council and Bradford Metropolitan District Council. In both these examples, these local governments have authorities over smaller areas with higher population densities. There are a mix of industries, often a mix of ethnicities, which can bring new challenges to local governments. Combined authorities are larger authority, authorities which have authority over combined rural and urban areas. They're usually above other councils and authorities and may consist of combined councils which they direct. A key example is the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, which includes several local government councils such as Kirk Lees and Leeds. There are specific exceptions to this where special areas have a different type of local authority, such as the London Assembly, an elected body. These only apply in very specific areas. A second point worth noting here is that there are, of course, bits of the UK which aren't in the four nations of the UK, such as the Isle of Man, which may recognise the head of state but have their own government, but may rely upon the UK for things like foreign affairs and the military. Local government is funded mostly through central government, which awards a grant to local governments based on their population. However, they do raise a proportion of their own funds through council tax. Every local government council is split up into smaller areas known as wards. Most councils have elections every two years for one third of the wards. Therefore, over a six year period, every ward elects a councillor and the whole council has an election. Generally, smaller parties such as the Liberal Democrats, Greens, UKIP, the Brexit Party and in the past even the BNP generally do better at local elections than they do at general elections. However, turnout is usually much lower at local elections, often below 50%. There are many possible reasons for this and in all likelihood it is a combination of the three, which means that turnout is much lower. There is less publicity and press coverage of local elections. They rarely get a mention in the national press and may be confined to local press only with a much smaller readership. The public has less direct relevance to the large issues and affairs. Therefore, in local elections, rather than voting on massive issues of foreign policy or the direction of government, the public is voting on smaller local issues. They may therefore feel less motivated to vote. There is less public knowledge of local government than there is of national government. To most people, their local government is merely something that happens. It's not publicised much and it doesn't happen in the news much. As a result, they may be less inclined to vote. Certainly, however, it is likely that people in local government are less relevant to the public. Most people can name and identify the Prime Minister and usually many senior cabinet ministers. This is not the case for local government officials. While there will be, in all likelihood, no more European elections in the UK, many things which did occur in, in EU elections, such as a smaller turnout, happened for the same reason as local elections. However, it is worth noting that even though there is unlikely to be any more European elections in the UK for the foreseeable future, as much of your specification and potentially parts of your exam was written before the UK left the EU, you may still be examined on it. It's therefore worth revising European elections as you would local government elections. Generally, revision you do for one around issues such as turnout will apply equally for the other. Local governments have a range of roles. Many people in the exam struggle to recall the precise role of local government. It's useful, therefore, to try and memorise this list and be able to talk about it in a long answer question. Housing, especially social housing, the provision of houses to people who need them and are in dire straits, is one area of responsibility of local government. If people are made homeless, especially if they have children, the responsibility is on local government to try and find them appropriate housing. Social services is also a power of local government, especially in areas where children are involved. Litter collection and the emptying of bins is another responsibility of local government, as is council tax. Council tax is organised and collected by local authorities. Should it not be paid, they will take people to court and potentially have bailiffs awarded to forcibly arrange payment. It is now a jailable offence to not pay council tax. 
the arrangement and taking of council tax is one of the key duties of local government, and it's a good one to put up in an exam. The maintenance of the road network in an authority comes under local government. It's up to them when, where, and if roads are maintained and repairs. Local government sets up local educational authorities, bodies which oversee and regulate local schools. While they're not purely a local government initiative, the local government is the main stakeholder. Registrar services as well, such as maintaining a register of births, deaths and marriages in an area, is something done by local government. Traditionally, for many hundreds of years, this would have been done through the church, and they would have kept books of births, marriages and deaths. However, as the UK becomes less and less church-going, more and more diverse in terms of religion, and more and more atheist, this is something which churches are no longer able to do, and it's fallen into the purview of local government. Something to remember here is that local governments have a lot of responsibility. Their funding may be limited. Different local authorities will place different emphasis on this role. Some, especially in urban areas, will prioritise things like housing and social services. In rural areas, it may be more about road ne network repair and maintaining the local environment. Devolved government can be defined as a government of an individual nation of the UK, which has powers over most matters in that nation. And there are three. In Scotland, the Scottish Parliament, based in Edinburgh, is the devolved parliament which elects a devolved government. In Northern Ireland, it is the Northern Ireland Assembly, based in Belfast. In Wales, it is the Welsh Assembly, based in Cardiff. Devolved administrations have powers over most matters, such as education and health. However, there are foreign affairs and defence. These are not devolved matters. These are handled by central government in Westminster. Devolution has at times been a controversial issue, especially from the 1970s through to roughly 2000. And there are several arguments in favour of devolution. Devolution allows those nations, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, to be represented at their local level. It prevents, the theory goes, strong calls for independence from the UK by granting a measure of independence while still keeping those nations within the United Kingdom. Devolution allows nationalist parties such as Plaid Cymru, the SNP and the DUP to have a voice in the running of those nations, further quashing, in theory, calls for independence. It takes power away from central government and decentralises power. This has been a policy of many governments of both political colours through the years. They all say they want to distribute power to a local level. Devolution is one way in which they can do so. Devolution lets the devolved governments deal with matters specific to those nations. For example, a major issue in Scotland has been offshore oil drilling. So rather than having a Westminster government deal with that, it's possible to let a devolved government deal with that. This is a double-edged sword. If you're a devolved government, it is nice to have power over your own country, but it means if things go wrong, it is you who is to blame. You can no longer blame central Westminster government for your troubles. Lastly, devolved government allows for the accommodation of issues and policies specific to a nation. We discussed earlier about how Scotland has a particular interest in offshore oil drilling and wind power. For Scotland, its dissolved government can deal with issues specific to that. There are also, of course, arguments against devolution. It is an increased tax burden. Devolved governments involve officials and elected representatives. Salaries must be paid, infrastructure must be maintained, a building must be constructed. This can all be expensive. The bill for the setting up of the Scottish Parliament and government ran into many millions of pounds, which had to be funded through the taxpayer. It adds an extra layer of government, whereas previously there would have been parish councils, local authorities and then central government. This adds an additional fourth layer. Devolution is a complex issue. It's not always well understood by the general public, and even now many people do not understand precisely what devolution means. They're unaware what matters are the responsibility of their devolved government and what matters come from central Westminster government. This can cause tension. Devolution can actually lead to increased calls for full independence. Devolution in Scotland happened around the turn of the millennium. However, in 2014, calls for independence have reached such a fever pitch that a referendum had to be held. Many people feel that devolution compromises the idea that the UK is one nation state composed of four nations. There are many unionists, people who believe in a strong union between the four nations, who feel that devolution compromises this idea and could lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom. Increased devolution has led to a, splint a splintering of politics into nationalist parties. The Conservatives and Labour used to be very strong in Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, but increasingly those nations are electing MPs from nationalist parties, such as the Scottish National Party, SNP, Plaid Cymru, the Party of Wales, and the specific Northern Irish parties like the SDLP, Sinn Féin and the DUP. Many people feel that this splintering of politics is bad. It leads to unstable or coalition governments in Westminster and means that governments don't have a clear mandate from the people. One key issue which crops up again and again and is often present on an exam 
in a way which many people struggle to deal with is the English votes for English laws debate. This can be a tricky question to answer. However, it can be summarised like this. Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish MPs can vote in Parliament in the House of Commons on matters which only affect England. Because many matters are devolved to devolved administrations in those three nations, many debates in Parliament on issues will only affect England. For example, if a change to education is being proposed in Parliament, because education comes under the purview of devolved governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, in reality MPs are only debating education matters in England. However, English MPs are unable to vote in devolved parliaments for matters which only affect Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Some people think that only English MPs should be able to vote on matters which are specific to England. Others think that matters in England affect the whole UK, as England is the largest and most populous nation, and therefore all MPs should be able to vote on them. In general, this debate has not purely gone down party lines. There are people on both sides of this debate in many parties. Generally, what are known as One Nation Tories tend to take the argument that English people and English MPs should be the only people voting on English matters. To summarise, however, the English votes for English laws debate has gone on for a long time. At present, it is the case that Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish MPs can vote in Parliament on matters which only affect England. English MPs are unable to vote in devolved administrations and parliaments. As yet, there is no change proposed to this. However, with Brexit happening, there has been an increased shift in nationalism in England, so it's possible over the coming years we may see a resolution to this question.